Welcome to My Messy Notes. Enjoy and learn, and don't forget to subscribe for more exciting future content and projects. In this lecture, we are going to talk about cirrhosis symptoms. Now, these aren't the major complications of cirrhosis that would designate a patient as having decompensated cirrhosis. These are symptoms that a decompensated and compensated cirrhotic can have, and these are the types of symptoms that should make you put cirrhosis on your differential, whether it's in a question stem, if these symptoms are in a question stem, or if they're in a patient you're seeing across from you, you should keep cirrhosis on your mind if you encounter these symptoms. And so we will talk about constitutional symptoms first, or mention them rather. Now, the constitutional symptoms that cirrhotics may have uh, are fatigue, malaise, weight loss, anorexia. So I'll separate the symptoms of cirrhosis by body systems. And while this isn't an exhaustive list, I included all the pertinent symptoms, especially for exams. So we'll start with endocrine. So one complication that produces several symptoms is the imbalance of sex hormones in patients with cirrhosis. And for this, we will look at a diagram. So you're all likely familiar with this diagram of steroidogenesis. And it was a diagram that was a bit intimidating and you didn't want to memorize it, but you didn't know if you needed to memorize it. And then you realize you only needed to memorize the pertinent steps. Well, same thing goes here. We only need to know well, for this lecture, anyway, we only need to know one specific part, and that's androstenedione. So, in a healthy patient, the liver is able to clear androstenedione, and so there's barely any aromatization of androstenedione to estrogen and the other estrogens. Androstenedione is metabolized in the liver without being aromatized, but with liver cirrhosis, androstenedione is not metabolized and therefore undergoes peripheral conversion into estrogens and then the other estrogens. So there will be an increase in estrogens. Also, there's an increase in steroid hormone binding globulin, which then attaches to testosterone and decreases bioavailable testosterone. Okay, so you have increased estrogen and decreased testosterone. So what results from this? So you get gynecomastia. Now, I'm going to put a question in parentheses here because although there's 60% of cirrhotic patients do have gynecomastia, this is pretty much equivalent to non cirrhotic patients as well. However, keep in mind that also spironolactone, uh, a diuretic that is commonly used for cirrhotic patients with ascites, and we're also going to talk about this in the ascites lecture, also have gynecomastia. It has gynecomastia as a symptom, as a side effect. So an estrogenic state with aldactone may be problematic to a cirrhotic patient. And this is what gynecomastia looks like, an increase in breast tissue. Also, if alcohol is the cause of the cirrhosis, alcohol itself acts on Leydig cells and inhibits testosterone that way. So it has a specific mechanism uh, for an increase in gynecomastia risk. Another symptom directly due to the increase in estrogens are spider angiomas. So this is what spider angiomas look like. They have a dilated central arterial, which shows as a red spot surrounded by smaller vessels that look like spider legs. So these, and so that's why they're called spider angiomas. If you take a glass slide and compress the lesion, you can actually blanch it. And it's a good way to diagnose it if you're unsure. If it blanches, then it's more than likely a spider angioma. If it looks like this and it blanches, then more than likely is a spider angioma. And you may be able to see the central arterial pulsate. These are usually found on the face, but can also occur on the upper trunk and upper limbs. Remember, because this is due to high estrogen, Pregnant women may also experience these, but they go away a few days after delivery. And in general, there shouldn't be more than three. I mean, it's, it's just an arbitrary number. If it's more than three, then it should raise your suspicions that maybe 
uh, another disease process is going on, like cirrhosis. Palmer erythema is also another symptom that is due to a high estrogen and it just basically red palms assume this is the palm of a hand the the erythema is mainly on the thenar eminence and the hypothenar eminence so it spares the palms there is also diminished pubic and body hair and this is also due to increased estrogen to testosterone levels of course with all of this men have decreased libido and testicular atrophy and women have infertility and this menorrhea so these are the endocrine systems I want you to know and next we'll move on to the musculoskeletal system Cirrhotic patients will have a decrease in lean muscle mass. So why is that? Well, cirrhotic patients are hypermetabolic and they enter a fasting state after only a few hours because their liver doesn't store glycogen well. So their livers are always undergoing gluconeogenesis if they're not fed, which means there will be muscle breakdown and hence a decrease in lean muscle mass. They also have muscle cramping. And this can be excruciating. It usually happens at night. It's it's and it's very very painful. Don't underestimate their muscle cramps. There are three mechanisms by which muscle cramping can occur in cirrhotics. And the first one is increased nerve function excitability. The next is altered protein metabolism. And there's also electrolyte and plasma volume changes. Most important thing is to know that there is muscle cramping and you're doing well. Another musculoskeletal symptom is hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. So osteoarthropathy you might be familiar with this because you learned it in terms of lung cancer. It was all over your world, but it also may appear in liver cirrhosis. Patients will present with clubbing, arthralgias, and periostitis. Now let's look at skin changes. So the first one I want you to know is Terry Nails. So this is what Terry Nails looks like. This is when a patient loses the lunula because there's a white appearance on almost the entire nail right here, except for the ends, right? If you see these ends, the ends, it's a normal pinkish color. So the entire nail except the distal end where there's a slight normal pink appearance on nail bed, that's a Terry Nail. So Terry Nails, loss of lunula, and distal pink nail bed. The other dermatological change I want you to know that is also a nonspecific nail finding are Merkey's nails. or Merkey's lines. So with Merkey's lines, uh, there are white bands that run horizontally. So you can see these white bands that run horizontally. They run across the entire width of the and in cirrhotic patients these lines resolve with the treatment of hypoalbuminemia. So what are Merkey's lines? They are white bands on nails that run horizontally from each other across the entire nail bed. The next thing I want you to know is Dupuytren's contracture. 
this is more pronounced in alcoholics. So it starts off as a nodule and it slowly progresses into what you see here. This contracture of the finger or fingers due to proliferation of the palmar fascia. And again, this is usually seen in cirrhosis caused by alcohol. So it's contracture of finger or fingers um, due to palmar fascia or proliferation of palmar fascia. So the next dermatological change I want to talk about, and also a very important one, which is why I changed the color, is jaundice. So that's yellowing of the skin or the eyes, uh, called scleral ectoris, or more appropriately, conjunctival ectoris, wh whatever you want to call it. Some people care, some people don't, it doesn't matter. Of, or the mucous membranes, particularly under the frenulum. The most important thing about uh, appreciating jaundice is just getting good lighting. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter where you look at it as much as uh, you need good lighting to be able to appreciate slight jaundice. So red blood cells are taken out of circulation every 120 days or if anything uh, causes the destruction of the red blood cell for whichever reason a macrophage takes it out. Okay, So let's draw a macrophage right here, it takes it out and then produces globin and heme. By the way all this, all these steps happen inside the macrophage. Until I say it happens in the liver, everything is going right now is going on in the macrophage. So then we have globin and heme. We don't care about globin; it's out of our scope right now. So then heme uh, oxygenates, then catalyzes the degradation of heme into biliverdin. We don't really care about the enzymes right now, so. So heme into biliverdin via heme oxygenase, uh, and biliverdin is a green pigment, and also iron, but we don't care about iron right now, also out of our scope. So biliverdin then breaks down into bilirubin via biliverdin reductase. This bilirubin is unconjugated bilirubin, also known as indirect bili. So this unconjugated bilirubin is lipophilic and there's no way to excrete it because it can't get into the bloodstream. So it has to be attached to an albumin so that it can get to the liver from the macrophage. Again, everything's happening in the macrophage until, unless I say otherwise. So without, a, without albumin, it can't get anywhere. So it's attached to an albumin and it travels all the way down to the liver. So just so I can make this clear, all this is macrophage. Okay, until it attaches to the albumin and then it can get leave the macrophage and then go to the liver. So now when the non-water soluble bilirubin enters the liver, it becomes conjugated via UDP glucuronyl transferase, also called UDPGT, also known as UGT. Doesn't matter. What happens is bilirubin enters and we leave with conjugated bilirubin. And of course there are enzymatic steps inside the liver specifically UDP glucuronyl transferase that conjugates the bilirubin. We're left with conjugated bilirubin, also known as our direct bilirubin, also known as our water-soluble bilirubin, and it's set on its way uh, into the right and left hepatic ducts. So what happens with cirrhosis, right? We have this unconjugated bili, attaches to an albumin, goes into the liver, gets conjugated in the liver, and then comes out as conjugated bilirubin. So with jaundice, we have increase an unconjugated bilirubin. Okay, why do we have this increase in unconjugated bilirubin? The liver processes have slowed down. We have we have this cirrhotic, fibrotic, nodular liver. The liver is backed up. All the steps are saturated from uptake to conjugation due to the decreased amount of conjugation that occurs. So this buildup of unconjugated bili causes jaundice. Another factor at play here is a decrease in urobilinogen uptake by the liver. So what's urobilinogen? So intestinal bacteria converts conjugated bilirubin to urobilinogen. 
Gerbilinogen then becomes Stercobilin or Stercobilinogen and it, and it gives the feces its characteristic brown color. However, a portion of Gerbilinogen is also taken up by the liver, the liver and the kidney. However, and, and most of the part that's taken up is taken up by the liver, not the kidney. However, because the liver is now fibrosed, it's cirrhotic, it can't be taken up anymore, right? It can't be taken up anymore. So what happens? The urobilinogen, what would have been taken up by the kidney, by the liver rather, now goes to the kidney. And because it goes to the kidney, you have more urobilinogen in the kidney, and urobilinogen is uh, spontaneously oxidized to urobilin, and it causes a darker urine. Also, the bile ducules between hepatocytes are now disrupted and they leak conjugated bilirubin. So you have conjugated bilirubin being leaked and you also have dead cells secreting the conjugated bilirubin as well. So now you have an increase in unconjugated bilirubin and then you have an increase in conjugated bilirubin as well. So you can actually find bilirubin in the urine before you see jaundice because of this. So you need greater than three milligrams per deciliter in the serum to appreciate jaundice. However, conjugated bilirubin isn't supposed to be in the urine. So if you can detect conjugated bilirubin in the urine, it means you're on your way to developing jaundice because you need a concentration as low as 0 0.05 milligrams per deciliter in the urine, in urine. You can detect it that low in the urine. So it way before we get to appreciate jaundice, we can actually see it in the urine. So we can know which patients may eventually develop jaundice. Lastly, I want to talk about some hemodynamic changes. So I'll erase some of this. And it's appropriately in red. So what hemodynamic changes do we expect? Well, we expect hypotension. So how does cirrhotics develop hypotension? Well, it's actually because of portal hypertension. Portal hypertension is a consequence of a cirrhotic liver causing backup of portal blood flow via several mechanisms. And there's also an increase in splanchnic blood flow due to the activation of several vasodilators, most notably nitric oxide. You have portal hypertension, you get an increase in nitric oxide, and this is actually important. It's always asked, by the way, and we'll talk about it later. Uh, and you also, so you you have an increase in vasodilation. Always remember, cirrhotics are vasodilated. If you know that cirrhotics are vasodilated, that's basically the foundation of many topics that we will talk about. So cirrhotics are vasodilated. So as a result, cirrhotic patients may develop hypertension. In fact, patients who are initially hypertensive go on to become normal tensive in their disease course, in the cirrhosis disease course and then develop hypotension. So as their condition worsens, their blood pressure lowers. I wouldn't recommend becoming a cirrhotic to treat hypertension, however. As a side note, this also makes it very difficult to determine if a cirrhotic has sepsis. You can't use the same criteria for other patients as you do with patients with cirrhosis, so you have to go by a MELT score, which we will get into the following lecture. Other hemodynamic changes include tachy cardia and an increased cardiac output. And just so this is complete now, even though I will talk about it in subsequent videos, portal hypertension also has involvement in a patient developing complications that we talked about before, but also more complications than that. So we talked about variceal hemorrhage and ascites, but it also portal hypertension, lower extremity edema. Uh, we talked about spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Well, we didn't talk about it, but we mentioned it. And we mentioned hepatorenal syndrome and hepatopulmonary syndrome, but also hepato hepatic hydrothorax, cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, and portal hypertensive gastropathy. So portal hypertension is, is a cause. In, in fact, these things don't develop without portal hypertension. So in the next video, I'm going to touch on lab values that one might expect from a cirrhotic patient. Okay, thank you.